Welcome, everybody, to another Vita Academy webinar. Today we have Mr. Felix Pages. Hi, Felix. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Um, so, everyone, today we're going to learn about uh, stain and glaze, but also about shade, because shade's a, a very Im important component, and shade is not just for the color, but also taking shade, treatment planning. Um, you know, it helps you find the nuances. Uh, try to figure out what kind of material that might best be best suited for that case. So it's it's all about shade and maybe if you have to enhance it, if you have to characterize it, that's where stains, glazes uh, comes into it. Um, but with uh, with Felix, uh, we have um, a very knowledgeable uh, technician that's been in the industry forever. Uh, I, I keep encouraging him to uh, write a book. Um, I think he is uh, quietly writing a book, uh, chapter by chapter. Hopefully, you'll you'll yeah. get something published one day. Yeah. By the time I finish, uh, the materials I'm writing about will no longer be used. <laughs> well, we're as you know, we're losing a lot of old uh, dental technology understanding and um, yeah. history. So. Uh, any, anything would be helpful for the young fellows and girls coming up uh, the ranks. Mm -hmm. Felix, um, Felix is a 1976 honors graduate from the University of Kentucky, Lexington Technical Institute. Uh, I don't think there's many of those around anymore. Any, um, you know, university-based dental technology um, uh, schooling anymore. Um, after graduation, uh, Felix worked with the prosthodontic uh, faculty at the University of Florida College of Dentistry and collaborated with uh, Dr. Harry Lundin and other members of the uh, faculty. In 1978, he relocated to California with the Unitech Corporation and became an instructor for Vita Porcelains. Uh, the following years, Felix was promoted to the laboratory project manager for all new products. Uh, during that time, Felix traveled and taught overseas in many parts of the world and presented many domestic and international meeting content, lectures, hands-on workshops. Felix is a founding member of the ISDC and was the first keynote speaker for the group in 1983. He was invited to speak at the first quintessence ceramic symposium in 1984. Also a founding member of the Claude Seaver Art and Experience uh, Group. Among other recognitions, he received a, uh, the FDLA Crowning Achievement Award in 2011 for his contributions to the dental laboratory industry. Felix is currently a key opinion leader for Vita North America and American Dental Group. So Felix, again, hi, I hope all is well. I'm going to uh, turn this over to you so you can get going. So I'm going to make you the presenter. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for giving up a, <clears throat> a beautiful Thursday afternoon. <laughs> the picture you're looking at now is a chart that is to calibrate monitors. And I've had these things for a long time because if you do this enough, you need to make sure that the colors look correct. And if your monitor isn't calibrated, you're never going to see the true color. But what's interesting is it's very, very similar to what we do with stains and colors in the mouth. So you can see that all these rows of colors from the top being like from black to white. This is known as a dynamic range. So when you buy a television set, this dynamic range is the more dynamic range you have. It's this HDR. That means that you see a lot more values of the same colors. So if you look, you can see any, any color you pick, green, yellow, orange, red, whatever, from the right side of the screen, which is closest to the, high, it is the highest value, it is still yellow, but then you can see all the different gradients. And this is what happens to natural teeth. You have slightly more translucent areas in the teeth and all this, and it's really difficult 
when you build up a crown or mill it out of a solid material like zirconia or whatever, if they're monolithic, you're not going to have the same value everywhere in the tooth or the crown that you make. And what happens is, is the color is influencing the shape. I always tell a story. If I take a statue of myself and pour it up in plaster, take an impression, and then, an, and then another one in clear resin or glass, they're both physically the same size but the white one reflects a lot more light and therefore it appears larger even though it really isn't. And this is what happens to crowns. If you don't get the value or brightness level correct, uh, it's all, it will always look bigger. When you're designing, quote unquote, a framework or a substructure to layer, if you have too much stuff in the interproximals and you don't give the person that's gonna be applying the porcelain, some room there uh, where they have these micro layerings or macro layering or whatever. I haven't had a one straight answer from anybody to tell me what exactly, how thick the porcelain's supposed to be. Because if you have a really thin porcelain overlay and you use Denton, let's say, or whatever, it doesn't have enough thickness to carry a color anyway. So you're mostly dependent on the color of the zirconia or the lithium disilicates lithium silicates, PFMs, whatever that is. And PFM, the opaque, needs to be modified so it looks like the final shade already so you can start from the bottom up to get good color. If not, they'll always appear a little more bright, uh, a little brighter and set, certainly more reflective because light doesn't go through metal. Let's see if I can change the screen here. Which button am I gonna hit? Of course, it's not doing it now. <laughs> Here we go. So when it comes to stains, uh, I don't like coloring the, uh, calling the stains uh, stains. I like colors. For instance, my one of my professors, John Hubbard in England, he, he calls it, a, uh, when he goes to take shade, he calls it a color reading. And uh, I told him, I said, don't use stain, you know, the name stain. And he goes, no, no, we knew that a long time ago, not to mention that stains to, in front of a patient. So it, if you have to do some adjustment, you say, well, I'm going to go to the lab and color your crown or whatever. If you work in a dental office environment, which is, which is what I do. So you have paste, you have spray, you have this, you have that. So it's like, which one are you going to pick? And I like things really simple. But before you get into any staining, you have to know what type of material you're trying to color. You have to know what the melting temperature of that restoration is. You have to know the flow temperature of the color or stain, whatever you want to call it. What does it fuse at? And are they compatible? Uh, uh, expansion wise and if the temperature range is acceptable to what you're putting it on. So for instance, if you were to use the original uh, Vita Chrome stains, they have a quite a high fusing point. You could not put those on the newer, lower fusing ceramic materials. Uh, you can always put a lower fusing stain on a higher fusing substructure like zirconia with uh, with LT glaze and things like this. What you have to be concerned about is how slow uh, it takes the zirconia to cook. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But a quick story, um, they made, um, Ivoclar made stains for Empress. And we have a good friend in Tampa that used Empress he, he liked Vita Dur Alpha, and uh, he said they were getting cracking on the surface. So Vita Dur expansion is quite low, low because it's an aluminous porcelain. And the Empress stains are very, very high expansion because it's a highly seeded lucite ceramic. And they were getting little fissures and cracks everywhere. And I called up, I said, Jerry, walk over to where your, your nephew is glazing and see if he see what he's using to glaze. He goes, no, he's using Vita. I said, go over there and look. And he was using Empress glazes. So when it, so that one, the porcelain was 
quote unquote shrinking more. If you think of this as an accordion, it was getting smaller and the stains stayed the same. And then you get a tensile crack, which are little cracks running up and down and everywhere. So you have to really think about these things and stick with a system that's uh, more compatible to what you're using. So let's look at another uh, deal. Vita, when we designed the uh, the original, you know, VM9, VM7, VM13, uh, we went with base dentine instead of uh, opaque dentine. So when you look at these pictures from Claude Siever book, you can see that if the dentine is quite thick, it looks like base dentine when it's thin. And so you have to remember, not all parts of the crown are going to have the same thickness of porcelain. That's a fairy tale. Somebody told somebody to tell everybody that, oh, you have to have a porcelain, even porcelain thickness. That's just impossible. The same with uh, preparations. You have a lot thicker enamel around the proximal than you do in the facial and the neck. It goes down to almost nothing. And so how can you prep it the same? You just can't. It's ridiculous. And so you have to adapt to your situation and you have to know your materials. That's really that simple. So when you're trying to quote unquote color something, what is it you're trying to color? So let's look at a few things. So I, I fire tabs all the time. So Vita is the only porcelain, even with the Lumex material, they may call it uh, opaque dentine and dentine, but it's really the same, almost the same translucency. So I fired tabs a millimeter thick and there you see the base dentine just put a black dot on a piece of photography paper and there's a 50 50 mix and then there's a transfer dentine or the regular dentine in the lumex and you can see that they're just slightly different so you could have some areas of the crown where you could or even a whole crown let's say a lateral is sticking out you might just use a base dentine and one that you have more room you can mix the two together so it's the only porcelain where you can change the translucency also. So you can change just the value, just the hue, just the chroma, and just the translucency. Nobody else can do that because most systems, if you're layering, the quote unquote opaque dentines are quite more opaque than the regular dentin or whatever you want to call it. So this is really the most manageable material to produce a good, a good shade. Of course, you know, it takes time to learn these materials and you have to fire tabs. I also fire tabs for the gingival portions. So you can see on the very top row that I have the normal colors and then I have the clear 50-50 minimum. You have to use at least 50-50 minimum in order for them to look like real tooth tissue. If you get the kit for the Lumex AC gingival kit, they they have a bottle of glaze liquid, which I have no idea why they did that, and the accent glaze, the low fusing LT glaze. I would suggest I've had a few people mix the glaze liquid with the pink materials, thinking that that's the medium for that those powders, which makes perfect sense if you don't read the instructions. So I would uh, suggest to Vita that they put regular modeling liquid in there, like the accent. I mean, like the uh, Lumex low fusing uh, porcelain, you know, the regular liquid to mix the porcelain. But you need to fire these tabs at least 50 50. The next thing you do is if you're doing big combination cases, like you see, I make the tabs. And so I pick them. The doctor picks them. I made these for one of the dentists. And he selects these shades. And then that picture gets sent to the lab. And then we try to do the best we can with that. Now, these are 50-50 mixes. And you can see right away, if you look at the human tissue above these tabs, it's just not one color. So whenever you're doing tissue porcelain, don't just use one color. It's ridiculous. you got to mix clear, 50-50, 75-75. Just use clear straight in some areas, especially around the teeth. If you have a fixed restoration and you have a, this, basically the area you're trying to reproduce is the free gingiva, which is almost like a translucent pink and you can see the tooth underneath it. 
So mix the clear with some really light pink, and that's what goes on top of the crown. And as you go to the papilla area, high spots and low spots, you can change the uh, intensity of that pink, and it, it will really look natural compared to straight out of the bottle, one color, and, and that's in any system. The next thing I'm doing is I'm, I don't know how many pucks I have of different resins and lucitone and everything else. And so I'm mixing and firing tabs so that we can match the different plastics, whatever you want to call them, uh, PMMAs that do denture bases. And then also the Anaxdent colors when someone does a hybrid and you do unit built framework and then you do single crowns. And then you put uh, this Anaxdent all over the place that you have to match that. So we could have a lot of cases that has an upper denture uh, and a lower implant unit built, and you have to have the same colors. So we're matching them up. And I think Vita is gonna do something as well. So in this typical situation here, uh, I use like a bone color underneath the tissue in this uh, difficult case. And then I use the stains from the accent stain, the pink, light and dark pink. And I take a little endophile and I draw the veins uh, uh, on the second bake. And then I put a little clear here and there. So it's light, dark contrast. And once they're in the mouth, it's very hard to tell that that's, that's tissue porcelain. Here's another example. This isn't cemented yet. It needs to be polished to get the right texture, but you can see how close the tissue color is. And what's amazing is the doctors, they think the pink looks like chewing gum because it did in the beginning when all this pink tissue started, but they don't produce the right type of tissue contour uh, where you could either just use straight porcelain all the way down or zirconia or whatever, because they don't do, uh, Ovoid pontics, the, the receptacles where the pontics are going to go, they look like a roller coaster sometime, and it's not the best scenario. So you have to kind of work around that. The next thing I like to do is I use photography to identify contrast zones in the teeth. So if you have to do a crown and you a next two one, this is an accident, you can see when I deliberately turn down the exposure. You can do this with in your in your image software. Um, I use Aperture from Apple. And then I can just change one thing at a time. But you can see in the middle slide where there's a big filling material and from the middle of the tooth up. So that's just a little stump there. And then, of course, the black and white you can see huge differences in contrast. So when you're building a crown like this, you can see the about three millimeters from the incisal edge is where you have a fairly sharp line where you have to build in some dentine and the enamel cutback has to be a little bit sharper. So just because you can take a picture, you need to learn how to photograph for contrast zones. And that way, when you're doing the buildups, you can do a cutback a little bit deeper in that area and not bring the dentine so far down because that particular case uh, doesn't require that. Some do, some ab absolutely do. When you photograph on the side, this is the day we try in an abutment, you can see the surface texture detail and actually high and low spots on that central. If, uh, if you don't have a good model, you can see where the light shines. That's usually the high spots and the shadows. But most important thing here is how do you reproduce that? So when you're dealing with zirconia, Ed McLaren's done a really great job in uh, recommending some tools, diamond tools, to do this. The, the thing with zirconia is, is you want to do this in the green stage because trying to do this in the final stage is very difficult and it's, uh, it's, it can be dangerous if you're grinding on the zirconia too much. So in this situation, this abutment is gonna be veneered 
over a white uh, abutment from Nobel BioCare, and we're waiting for that tissue to build in a little bit. As you can see right there, if you're doing abutments, you have to make sure that the preparation that you're making on that abutment, the finish line, that the framework, the abutment itself, goes all the way up to support the papilla. If you shy this and it's not high enough, the crown has to be over contoured to produce the support of the papilla and you create an undercut and a food trap. So you have to really make sure when you, you design, you know what the heck you're doing. You can talk about being a designer all day long, but unless you're sitting there watching the teeth and how, all to, how it all works, uh, I can guarantee you that you're going to learn something if you're if you're having to receive work from somewhere else and it's like, oh, God. So now you have to either, the nice thing about this is we can add VM9 porcelain to the abutment and fire it on a platinum pin and correct anything that we want to on those zirconia abutments. You do a bonding layer and then you build it up to where you want it and cut it back in the mouth. And we try it in. That way we get perfect support for the papilla. And that's in the book uh, from uh, uh, what's it, Marcus Blatz and uh, what's his name, Garam Garambola from Spain, the, the evolution of the single anterior implant above. It's an excellent book. So, what is the surface type that you're trying to glaze? What is it? Is it a Vita block? That, those things really have a high melting temperature. And they will not glaze by themselves and they won't distort, you know, unless it's see through and you're trying to put porcelain on it. But typically, I mean, there's no problem with these things. And they've been around forever and they melt high. Now, if you're trying to create some type of surface texture, you have to remember that if you use, if you have a diamond and you do a rough finish on it and you put glaze on it, the, the glaze can wipe out any surface texture because you put it on too thick if you put on the too thin you won't you will see any grind mark that'll stay because the surface of that vita block isn't going to change at the normal temperatures where we glaze like if you use the lt glaze it'll be 760 780 whatever uh, if you use the old i mean the accent stains those are going to be uh, the, the, you can go all the way up to 950 on those, and that's not going to change at all because the surface is so high fusing that your glaze isn't going to do anything. Now, if you're using a low fusing material like Lumex, let's just say, and you grind it and you put the glaze on it and you run it up just a few degrees too high, you, that surface can smooth down and you'll lose some of that surface texture. So sometimes you have to learn how to use that material. Also, uh, if you air braid, you're removing glass from that surface really deep and it leaves pits. So if you're trying to stain, let's just say a gingival area to produce a little bit more chroma, uh, the stain can settle in those pits and it's not the best look. So sometimes you have to smooth it down and uh, relieve the surface tension. I use uh, Ajax and a toothbrush, and it's easier, to, it's easier to stain a smooth surface. The stain will flow on it. It's like if you have a glass slab and you pour honey on it, it'll push all the air out. But if it's pitted, you trap air bubbles in the surface. So you have to, the surface has to be a certain way where you can get both the nice glaze uh, and no pitting. If you rubber wheel the surface, it may produce a really high surface energy. And when you try to stain it, it'll beat up. That you just do a, do a Ajax and a toothbrush and you can paint it perfectly. So what happens if you have an abutment that's really high in value? Because if you use, let's say, Nobel BioCare and the ASC abutments, if you guys know what that is, it comes in very limited colors, and they usually are too white for the shade. And so if you have this, quote, unquote, thin veneer, whatever you want to call it, it's very hard to, to get it 
with a half a millimeter of porcelain or so how can you produce anything when you have a half a millimeter of porcelain? You can't use the regular dentin. So you're fighting creating a translucent restoration <laughs> and you're fighting space. So I like to have a little bit more than uh, that, especially on an abutment, which is made out of zirconia, unless the thing's coming through the front. You know, you can reduce those a little bit and get a little bit more reasonable um thickness for the porcelain i like a millimeter personally if you can't do that then you have to compensate with color so if you look on the right you can see that i took the uh darkest colors like let's just say a 4m2 and you build it up in the 4m2 and that will compensate for your target which was around a, a 2m2 so you see a lot of times these sandwich combinations, you gotta know where to put the mayo and where to put the cheese and everything else until you hit a target. And that's a that's becoming us learning to be a ceramist, not just somebody that puts porcelain. So let's look at what's available. Here you have the powders, it'll say V dot glaze 25, uh, glaze LT, low feet, low temperature glaze, and finishing agent. So I've always had a uh, a different opinion than a lot of people on on these things. So for instance, I like the LT glaze. It'll work on anything and it's very clear and that, that I like. The finishing agent we made because the Claude Sieber liked to rub in this finishing agent and fill any little pits. So like if it's it's like walking on a beach we got plenty of them down here in florida so you're walking on a beach and you step on a rock and you say well wait a minute the rock's bigger than the sand how come the heavy particles didn't settle down well, that's because there's nowhere for them to go but the little tiny ones go down it's the same with porcelain if you move or tap it a little bit too much the bigger particles go to the surface and then when you grind it with a diamond or stone to shape it you might pluck out a slightly bigger particle and then it looks like you have a little pit. If you look at it under a good scope, you don't want to look what's in there. But Claude Sieber used to take this finishing agent and he would rub it in with water to fill in any little pits. And then we could glaze over it and fix that. It also has a nice finish to it. I like it. So the problem is you can't use it on low fusing materials, but you can certainly use it on higher fusing materials like Vita blocks or anything else. You can do whatever you want with that as long as it's a higher fusing porcelain. Let's say like VM13 or VM9, not a problem. Uh, and when it comes to Lumex, don't use it because it'll 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 look white when you finish because the Lumex will start to melt. And if you go, if you go to 900 Celsius, then the Lumex will it's not good for it. So you got to remember, you, if you need to help Lumex glaze, always use the LT glaze, which will go to about 760, 770 without issue. The Vita Accent 25, I don't like it. I've never hardly used it. And it fluoresces a yellowish green. It doesn't fluoresce bluish like the other two. That's for the older porcelains that didn't have any fluorescence in it whatsoever. So I would, uh, I mean, just use the LT glaze for everything and you'll be good. So are they high fusing, medium fusing, or low fusing? What is it that you're using? Other companies, I don't know what you're using, but you better be careful. So the glazing of the crowns, you have to know the, the surface, you have to know what liquids you're going to use, and the refractive index of the liquid. What is the refractive index? Refractive index is how a uh, translucent material changes the direction of the light when it enters it. So if you've ever sat on the edge of a swimming pool like we have here, and your leg looks like it's bent, it's because the, the light is traveling through air, and then it hits water, and it changes direction, and it looks like your leg is bent. So with that said, depending on the liquid, the accent liquid is very high. I mean, it's a perfect 
as you can get as far as refractive index of 1.5 ish which is the refractive index of glass saliva is 1.3 uh, zirconia is 2.1 so that no matter what happens when you have a full contour zirconia crown a lot of times it's very hard to match the natural teeth because the refractive index is so far off of what human enamel is which is 1.62 now in the old days when we used to do vitador crowns alpha we used to put that on inseram so alumina is 1.7 and glass is 1.5 and you add those up and divide by two and you get the same refractive index as natural teeth and that's why that material really blended nice without a lot of work because the refractive index matches if you were to take other companies liquids mix it with a glaze and you'll see if it turns a little whitish is okay if it turns really white that means the refractive index is is off and you'll never be able to tell the real color of the stains because the liquid is not matching the refractive index of the glass stains so liquids are really important and what's in it uh you know, uh, is also important. So if you were to take internal fluid, let's see if I have that picture. You have to know the material you're preparing to glaze, the temperature, particle structure, and you have to match an abrasive to the material structure. So you don't want to go after uh, some fairly soft porcelain with some super aggressive, you know, if you start hearing noises like, wow, with a handpiece and all that, you have to change abrasive so you don't you have to have cutting efficiency doesn't matter how fast you're going a lot of these burrs you have a certain rpm that they work best at and you have to do that my my hand pieces unfortunately don't have a speedometer on it where you can actually see what the speed of the burr is rpm wise and that's where the, your cutting efficiency comes in so most of these diamond burrs are designed to be run from like 5,000 to 7,500 RPMs. If you're doing 10,000 or 20,000, it's just overkill. It doesn't finish as, as well. Now, the liquid powder ratio, what is it that you're gonna stain? So a lot of doctors like paste stains. I despise paste stains. I don't know why anyone would ever wanna use them. Uh, they take forever to dry yet they want everything to be done faster they want a faster zirconia cycle they want to speed fire this speed fire that do this do that but it's okay to do eight minutes or ten minutes of dry time for a for a paste stain i i, I mean it's senseless if your liquids that you're using for your stains evaporate super fast uh they usually don't have a good refractive index so the uh, accent fluid is probably the closest liquid you have the spray i'm not uh, convinced i mean it's all over the place i just don't like uh like that i like regular old powder and liquid and i spoke to geller not too long ago and he he made a new kit it's called magic or something it's magic geller magic stain kit and it only comes in powder and he said, yes, he goes, if I want to use it inside, I can just pick it up and put it inside. If I use paste inside, I run a high danger of blowing this thing apart. Now, as far as handling and all this, if you mix the stains the right way with a regular liquid, the accent fluid, they last forever. We keep it in a O-ring sealed container, which I'll show you in a second, and they last a long time. You don't have to worry about those evaporating. Excuse me, let me turn my phone off here. So that's the situation where you have to make sure that the you know your materials. That's that's the key to just about everything. And let's go to the next one. You have to be careful. If you use, let's say, for instance, uh, v, the regular Vita modeling liquid and you build up a, a uh, Lumex crown, the whatever they put in there doesn't burn out clean and you get a gray look 
the same thing with propylene glycol, which was the original steel stain liquid. That's okay. It burns out quick. The refractive index isn't perfect. Uh, better than glycerin, which will turn your crowns black sometimes. And you can buy all different kinds of glycerin mixes. And of course, that's what I'm sure is in all these liquids. I haven't really, to me, I, I mean, I'd like to know in there, but sometimes they, it's hard to get a straight answer from the manufacturers. They don't really want to tell you what they're doing, and I don't blame them. So let's say, for instance, you see this liquid on the left that says interno fluid. This liquid was developed for these beautiful ceramic stains. They, they, were, they were ground up porcelain, really fine, and they were put inside, in, internal, uh, on the VM series. If you are to use this liquid and those stains on the lower fusing porcelains, it doesn't burn out. And that liquid will turn the crowns black, gray black, so it doesn't burn out clean. The accent plus paste fluid, that's just to mix those paste stains. And I don't ever use it, so uh, I don't care about this. The other one is the regular powder fluid. And that works really well and it really looks nice when you mix it. Mix a white, mix your glaze with a little bit of water. Mix it with. Uh, any one of those liquids and when you mix it with the powder fluid it'll almost become transparent which means the refractive index is really close to the powder that you're using and that's how i do the testing on it so every liquid has its place and you just have to be careful on the firing temperature of the material so what are these stains made out of they're usually some type of metal oxide for instance, chromium produces a beautiful pink stains, and then you can mix them in with glass and grind the heck out of them. That's the same way they do porcelain and the same way they do zirconia. It's just uh, a little more or a little less on, in, a, in a glass base. In the old days, there was very little glass in those stains, and then you could see it just, this was the old beta chrome, the original ones, which was back in the 60s. I mean, you just couldn't use them very well externally because you'd have to mix them with something that would help them glaze. Now they glaze beautiful, it's not a problem. Now some stains are more translucent and some stains are more opaque. So you have to think of where you're using what, what is it, what's your target? So with the accent stain kit, it has the body stains, which are BS, it says, body stain. And they're, they're very nice and translucent. And I use those to just barely touch up a little bit. And it's okay if you mix two of them together. <laughs> it's fine, because you're not gonna get every shade like that. And of course, the, the regular accent plus stain kit, uh, I think there's way too many colors in there, but the ones that I migrate to the most are the, uh, you can write these down if you want. Effect enamel one, I mean, effect stain one. ES stands for effect stains. Two, the cream. Effect stain two is very good. I have no idea where you would use effect stain three, except if uh, Tweety Bird uh, needed a touch up. I use ES5. I use ES7. And then I do use the two pinks, light and dark, to characterize. I do use the 11 and the 12. I don't care for 10 at all. I don't ever use the gray. And I do have the black. And that's it. And I do like the body stains. Those are very efficient. So how thick do you mix these stains? It really depends on the liquid. So if if you wa if they're watered down too much, that you'll see them roll on you, and if you don't change it, they'll look spotty because the 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 stains float in the liquid. It's the same thing as if you apply glaze uh, first on a crown. Let's just say a zirconia crown, and you say, okay, I want to do this in one shot. 
it's got to be in one shot. So then you put uh, the, the glaze and then you put a little stain on it. And sometimes they'll roll and next thing you know, wherever you put the stain on one area is going to be somewhere else. <laughs> so it's better to do two, two bakes, set your stain and then cover with glaze. But you can also take just a little bit of the LT glaze and mix it with some of your accent stains and it'll reduce the firing temperature. And that way you can do it in one shot. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. Now, when you're letting these things dry, you have to really, on the bigger zirconia cases, you have to really slow down the drying. Set your initial temperature like a 400 and just let the thing sit there. And the reason is, is it takes, let's say you have an abutment or a regular crown next to a pontic, a big fat molar. It takes so long for that molar to heat up and you can watch the, the glaze that you're putting on it. It'll dry on the, on the two crowns either side of a pontic, let's say, and the pontic will still, will still be cold. And so you can't run it up that fast because that that may cause a little blistering or bubbling. So you got to be patient, especially when you have off-size crowns, thin ones next to a big fat ponic. You just got to say, well, the ponic is the standard. We have to slow it down until everything turns white, and then I run it up. So think about that. If your stains are running and pooling at the margin, you're obviously too wet. Brushes make a big difference. So the natural is the best, the Kalinsky brushes. Synthetic blends are getting better. Synthetic brushes, depending on what it is, most of these orange ones, a lot of people use these orange color bristles on a white pearl handle looking brush. I'm not gonna name it, but I think those are pathetic brushes and the distance between the hair that their their nylon is too big and it sucks up the liquid and the stains or the porcelain and so you have a brush that is fighting with the crown for the liquid or the porcelain so one and two are ideal zero one or two are ideal for coloring and glazing any large sizes will complete work will, will compete for fluid between the brush hairs they act as a sponge and not as an applicator. So when you start looking at brushes, don't waste your time or your money buying some cheap vinyl brush. Get a natural hair brush, and you can get them at an art store or whatever. Just don't mix your stains with it. Mix it with a silicone mixer. So the sponges, you see the difference? The Vita sponges used to look like the one, the sponge on the left, which is from Renford. I don't know if they sell them anymore. This is a really old slide, but they brought these new Vita sponges, and I said, what the heck happened here? And so they fill up with water too quick if you're doing buildups, and it's it's really frustrating. So I, I, I put two on top of each other because they fill up with water, and you can tell when your brush doesn't tip nicely that it's full of water. So remember, the sponges just help your the point, your brush, get a nice tip on it. That's really important because you want the, the, the liquid or whatever to flow off the tip of the brush. You don't want it inside the brush because there's capillary action. Whenever you have hairs really close together, it'll want to suck it up. That's called wicking, W-I-C-K-I-N-G. So the same thing as a candle wicks up the wax so it'll burn, that's so what happens to the liquid. And with a porcelain, you're building with this brushes. The porcelain gets inside the hair, and then it's yuck. And so you can't really build nice. You're fighting with the brush. You don't want to do that. The distance between the hairs or brush produce capillary action, which fights the crown for liquid. The hair space must be min minimum, and the hair must be natural sable, which has oil, and it keeps it pointed and it doesn't get uh, scratched like the nylon does. So the nylon gets scratched by the porcelain and you get split ends. If you have a good scope, microscope, look at the ends of a, one of those orange brushes and you can see split ends everywhere and that produces little tiny bubbles in the, 
in the glaze and in the buildup. So one of the best brush makers is Da Vinci Brushes in Germany. And they are they produce top brushes for artists and they still have a supply of Kalinsky Sable. They they changed the company not too long ago and they have a new metal line now. It's a metal handle brushes. Some of them can be quite uh, costly. But I, I, I'm using, uh, I still have some art and experience brushes, which they don't make anymore either. But uh, Chris Bradley at Smile Line has, still has some good ones. When you use a mixing palette, you need to use something that's at least 96% white. That's the same way when you buy photo paper. Uh, you can see it's uh, white or not so white. 96 allows you to see everything. And that's a really good uh, for, for your color. So you have stains. If you mix them on a glass slab, you can't see the colors that well. So by mixing them on a white palette, uh, you can see exactly what color you have. And then it has to be large enough so that you can mix a couple together. And you have to have an O-ring to prevent dust and keep them from drying out. So we use the Magello pal palettes. You can get them at Amazon for like, I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 15 bucks. And these are the bigger ones, but that's what I use. And this is how I have all the stain kits in there. Body stains on my right, and then all the other colors that I use. And then I can mix some in the middle. I have the glazes right in front of me. Some whites and creams, very important. So here's another one. So let's look at these stains, these chroma stains. So if you look at all of these, these are the chroma stains for the 3D system. And they all look orange to me and they have really very little to do with the 3D shade guide, but they are there are some nice oranges in there. And then these are the classic A, B, C, and D chroma stains, which are excellent. And I mix them up and paint them on and I mean, it's hard to miss with those. So here you can see the 3D shade guide, the value on the gray one. You can see OM1, OM, uh, 1M1, 2M1, 3M1, 4M1, and 5M1. That's how I put my uh, 3D guide. And you can see that none of them look orange, but they do look like the classic ones. So the type of stains for you to understand is effect stains are usually more opaque and body stains are usually more translucent. The ones that will always appear uh, more translucent, even though they're effect stains, are the blues and the violets. Uh, and so I'll show you a few things you can do with this. So this is a crown on number, I can't remember, eight, I think it was. And what is it that you're trying to stain? Is it the gingival tones or the incisal? So I did a pretty decent job matching it, but it's not perfect. And you can see that it's more opaque towards the neck, but that's because I have a nice big fat zirconia coping underneath there that'll never let the light go through. So in this case, some of the incisal effects are more opaque than the dentine itself. Could I have done maybe three crowns more and get it? Yeah, probably, but can see it anyway from a, from a normal viewing distance. So those, what I do is I take the stain kit with me and that orange that you see there, I mix that with white to opacify it. And then I touch it right next to the effect that I see in the mouth. And when I can barely see where I put it, that's the stain I'm gonna use. I learned that in a body shop when somebody crashed into my car. They sprayed a little uh, paint on there when they said, well, here, I can't see this one, this is it. I said, well, hell, I can do that with my teeth. So I put a little bit of color right next to the effect, not on top of it. And that kind of helps me a lot in uh, determining what colors I'm going to use inside or outside, whatever your, whatever your preference. So the problem is, in this day and age, it is impossible to ignore the lightness level of the stains. Yet we do it every day. I coined that phrase in 1990, okay? And it's still true, and the stains are never 
the same value as the shades that you're trying to match. So you have to be able to control that. So if you have a stain, let's just say they made a, a theoretical stain that looked like an A2, is it, it should be soft and translucent like an A2 shade guide look, but they never are. So you have to create a way to increase or decrease the value. Vita had a had some stain, had a plus or minus value powders in one of the kits, but they never introduced it. It's just a little gray uh, and white. So you can still do that. So you can see this is 5M1, 2, and 3. So I put these stains that are as close as possible, and then I mix these things with white or gray, as you can see, and then I would touch them on the surface until I can barely see what I'm where where I put the stain. And then once I have that, that's it. So the whole trick is to if you can get access to the patient, you know, glove up, put your mask on, do the whole bit, get a little brush. Don't double dip in front of the patient and go ahead and just have the doctor, you know, retract and then you just put a little dot of stain on the tooth wherever you see something that you want to reproduce. And once you can barely see where you put it, that's that's what you do. I have all those slides, but I'm, I'm going to run out of time. So here you see a crown. You can see by the margin, that's the day we put it in. And all those characterizations are either a bluish, a cream, a white, all of those right there in the incisal edge. And those are external stains. So I get the I get the thing and I build it up and then I start streaking it. If you want to, you put a little bead on the halo right on the edge of the crown and create a halo and then to take a real thin brush and just pull up and make those little striations going up. And that's the best way to reproduce that. Is it perfect? No. Do they pay me enough for those crowns? No. But it looks really, really good. In the mouth, you can't see it. This is blown up pretty big. When you can see a little tiny tooth with lips around it, it's very hard to see, to tell it's a crown. Here's another one. What color does this crown need? So this lady came in to do her central. And then she went, you see all those spots on there? That's Invisalign. She had, uh, or she, yeah, she had braces or she had something. And then uh, we did this crown and I was gonna color it a little bit. She goes, no, 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 let's wait till we grind all this off. But it's a very good uh, reproduction, shape-wise and everything, and it's, uh, she liked it, and she's going to try to take all the stuff off and polish it. I'm probably match better. I haven't seen her since I did the crown a few weeks ago, but I'm probably look better than if I were to to have stained it. So you have to learn when to stop as well. But you can see the bottom corner of her natural central has got a chip in it, and you see some crack lines in there. I did a little bit, but not nothing dramatic. So they scare you because they don't want anything on the crown. They think that by doing one whiter crown that she's going to change totally. And it's just not how it works. But you can't convince them of that. So she likes that one. And I'm fine with it. It looks pretty good. So what happens is the final color is a combination of a base color of whatever material you're using. Let's just say lithium disilicate or lithium silicate and a colorant, which would be the stain on top. As soon as that light hits the surface, some light's gonna go in, some light's gonna bounce around, and some light's gonna bounce out again. And it's the speed of which the light goes in and out of a crown that causes it to look natural or higher in value in the mouth. So an opaque stain will stop the light in the surface, which can produce a favorable effect, like a crack line or a halo. That means you have real nice soft enamel, whether it's an enamel look from the zirconia, like a 5Y, uh, or if you build up with enamel like two millimeters up from the incisal edge into the body without a lot behind it, then you can put this little tiny halo and drag those lines up and they really look natural. So to enhance a shade, let's just say it's an A2, but it's not, I wish it was a little bit 
quote unquote the term warmer. The doctor asked a friend of mine if he could warm the crown up and he said, how warm do you want it? What temperature? <laughs> and he meant that the color needed, it was too reflective. So you have to use something that's a little bit more chromatic, but also has to have the same translucency and value because if not, it'll appear opaque where you're putting it. So if you look at these levels of translucency, you say, well, if I can see through it, on the bottom left hand, you see one that's obviously too opaque. You can't see the star. In the middle, you can see just barely a little star. So if you were to compare, let's just say translucent porcelain like window from the other kits and the new Lumex Clear, the Lumex Clear wins as far as translucency hands down. It, it's beautiful material. And that, that I've never been a big uh, user of window because it's never been that clear. But with the Lumex, I can use it and have very good, very good results. So the whole idea is, is where do the effects lie? Are they on the surface? Or are they just on the inside? Can I go ahead and smooth down a little bit, paint, and then go ahead and, uh, and cover with clear? Sure. I, that's my preferred way to do it. Uh, but sometimes there's not enough time to do these things, and you've got to knock it out in one shot and hope for the best. So what happens if you use too rough of a finishing material? You can, you can have lines all over the crowns that the stain will accumulate in between the surface texture. Air abrasion on regular porcelain removes uh, some glass and you get pits everywhere. And then when you try to stain it, it looks like a speckled trout. So you don't want to do that. If you have a restoration that has a higher melting point, um, let's say zirconia, the surface is not going to be affected during the glazing process. If you had a Lumex restoration, which is lower temperature, if you go a little bit too high, you can lose the whole surface. It'll look smooth. It'll round the corners. Even though it's hard to destabilize Lumex, I've had very good results up to eight. 810, 815, no problem. But I usually go 780, 770. So the whole idea is, is how do I glaze these different materials and how do I finish them down? So you need to have, I like, I prefer like an 842R diamond, which is a straight cylinder. And it's a for slow hand piece, slow speed hand piece. And then you just uh, finish that down. And then I use a 20 micron plated diamond, it's a red striper with a point to finish down the surface. In 1985, after I lectured in 83 for the ISDC, I showed a ring like a, a rather big uh, holder for keys, those chrome rings. And what I did is I had a bunch of natural teeth, I drilled holes in the roots and I had them hanging there like a predator <laughs> and I would keep them in a in in a ringer solution which is artificial saliva and then I would try to look at the texture and gloss of the teeth to try to match that as well so John Hubbard in 85 um, said you know I really like this and so what he did is he made himself uh, well, Vita made it for him, Texture and Luster Guy. There's only like three in existence, and Vita has two, and John Hubbard has one. And they decided that it was just too expensive to make, and so they made this uh, gray shade guide with tabs so you could do whatever you want yourself. But this was so beautiful. So he had seven layers of textures and four different glosses. And you can see clearly how it is. So Hubbard takes his color reading and he takes this thing and he says, okay, it's texture three, luster two, et cetera, et cetera. And we were trying to revive that, but I don't think Vita is gonna do anything. So here's some crowns that John did uh, using this texture luster guide. And these are lithium disilicate crowns. And they really look good. They're six anteriors. 
And so the whole point is, to me, they're a little bit on the rough side personally, but if you put saliva on top, you can't see that anyway. So the whole idea is, is how do you really view the teeth? Do you view them dry or do you view them, view them wet? And once they're wet, they look exactly like the teeth. And so this is, this is the, the time that it takes to create things like this. It's not easy and it's impossible to do in a big commercial lab where everybody wants these things to come out perfect, but uh, there's no time to do them. And the whole idea is, is if you're trying to reproduce surface texture on zirconia, you have to do it in the green stage. And I would suggest you listen to McLaren and it's still hard to do. So if you have too much of a scratchy surface on zirconia, it'll eat up your, your, your opposing dentition. So you got to make sure the occlusal table, the linguals are super slick so they don't wear anything. Facially, if you put a little glaze on top, you have to be careful that you don't put too much glaze because it'll have such a glass skin on it, you wipe out the texture that you worked so hard to build. So it's a, it's a tough thing. You got to work it out yourself. So what are the particle size of these restorative materials? Look at the, uh, this is from 3M from quite a few years ago with a regular lava framework and the lava plus. These are really tiny. They're like less than a micron. And so when you have that smooth of a finish, it doesn't wear natural teeth if the occlusal table is polished. So the material is so solid that it's known as a, it's a double refractive material and it always looks bright in the mouth. No matter what you do with most zirconias, you have to be careful. Unless you use a five wide zirconia, which is highly cubic, and sometimes they will have quite a, you know, it'll be a little grayish look to it. But the main point for this is that if you're going to finish something like this, and this material is quite hard, you have to use slightly different materials in order to get the surface to look like you want. So I use rubber wheels with diamonds all the time, and then I use the old gray pre-polisher that Vita has sold for years, and I just use Ajax and a toothbrush, and I can put glaze on top, and it works beautiful. These are particle sizes of a micron and a little bit bigger in the uh, Empress CAD, you see? These guys are tiny, one micron, but they appear, they're a lot softer than the zirconia. So you, you really should uh, use uh, less pressure when you do these things. And these materials will start to roll and melt at around 800. So you have to be really careful. You could have beautiful anything like lithium silicate, lithium disilicate, uh, saprinity, any of those that the temperature is lower. When you run up close to that 800, 810 mark, you can it can start to move and change your surface texture. So I use an 8859. I get mine from Cardinal Dental. And uh, any good fine diamond burrs that are plated, you don't want centered diamonds because they keep changing shape. I've never been a, I never like centered diamonds. You wear them a little bit and then you have to change the handpiece. I like a cylinder shape where I can go left to right or whatever and I don't have to move around too much. And I use a pointed diamond and I use one that looks like a Christmas tree to get into some interproximals. Let's see. Now, if your glaze medium or your stains are beating up, that means the surface tension is too high. And if you fire these things, if you can see the glaze rolling up from the margin, that means it's way too smooth and you have to break the surface tension. And that you can do with uh, Ajax and a toothbrush. And then that glaze will apply, everything will apply perfect. And you have to be careful not to overcook your glass. If you run it up too high, you ruin it. Here's a beautiful example of uh, adhesion and cohesion. See, wetting, non-wetting, uh, partial non-wetting. I mean, it's amazing. This is from the glass industry. And you can see where the glass gets so hot that it beads up on itself and pulls away from the material. This is what happens if you don't have enough heat on the zirconia. The glaze will just sit there and ball up. 
Same like Lumex. If you have too fast of a firing cycle on a low fusing porcelain, when you're trying to bond it to zirconia, the framework doesn't get hot enough to receive the material. And then it pulls up on itself. And that's no good. So that's why you have to wait till the zirconia gets hot enough. You have to leave it like around 400, 450 for quite a few minutes if it's a big case. And then the Lumex, the glass point, is fairly low. It's like 560. So you have to make sure that the zirconia is ready to accept that. If not, it, it will fire and start pulling up on itself instead of flowing to the framework. Okay? Here's another thing that I did. I took every stain, every glaze I had, and I started to paint them, and I started at 740. 750, 760, 770. I stopped at 770. The uh, pink stains started to get a nice shine at 770. At 800, everything had a shine. But look at the glaze. If you look at the 760, the way that that crown is turned, you can see the LT glaze fused beautifully as low as 740. 760s had a, had a nice look to it. See? So if you see the crown on the left, the middle has nothing on it. The left has the LT glaze. The right is this dark pink. And then you can see where it's just starting to get some color. You can see the white streaks on the middle crown left to right. That took a shine. So did the violet and so did the darker blue. And then the other chroma stains, they all glazed. 800 was good. So don't go as don't go below 750 uh don't go higher than 800. the only difference is going to be if you have a big fat zirconia ponic you gotta let it sit there longer you can you can uh you can run that up sometimes i get people call me up they'll say hey everything glazed but my ponic didn't glaze up because it's not hot enough to help the help the glass cook so that's all, you'll get it after a couple of tries. Now on posteriors, what I usually do is I polish the surface. Before I polish, I take the old uh, Fumo 3, which is, uh, what's in it? what is that? It came from the accent kit, the original one. It's like a really dark brown. And then I mix that with water and I run it in the grooves. And then I take a big brush and wipe everything off. So this anatomy that you see is a library. I'm not sure whose it is, but there's so many libraries. You can get a fairly natural look and then you just stain them. I use water to mix that brown stain because uh, if you use the regular liquid to try to stain an occlusal uh, surface, that liquid keeps moving and rolling and then the stains move. But if you use water for a dark brown stain, Paint it in there and then brush it all off and it only stick to the low spots. And that's it, leave it alone. And then I, I go ahead and put glaze around the crown and then I polish the occlusal surface. All the literature prefers polished zirconia to glazed occlusal surface zirconia. And that's what we do. If you're gonna mix the stains, you wanna use silicone mixers. I don't like glass rods or any of that. It's they squeak and uh, it gives me the chills. So this stuff is much easier. These these you get them at an art store. They just look like a wedge. And then I use a black uh, little tile, and I can't find the other picture. I don't know what I did with it, but I mix my glaze with the glaze liquid on a little tiny black tile. It's about two inches two by two. And what that does is it tells me if I can see it a little bit white, if it's too white, there's a lot of stain, a lot of glaze in it. If it's real clear, I don't have enough glaze. It's very hard to mix uh, glaze to know this is how it's supposed to be. Even if it's paste and they have a magical formula for doing that, when you add the liquid, it's the same thing. You have to really mix it thick. Sometimes the paste glaze the original ones were turning on white. They weren't really glazing out. 
So that I like the powder and I mix it on a black slab. It helps me determine the right consistency. And here are the stains mixed with the polisher. They almost look like those Mio or whatever you call it stains, but I mix them and then I, I just dilute them a little bit when I use them. And it's really easy to mix it with these palettes. I'm not going to go into all this color science for this course, but we can identify a few things. Contrast. What, where, what is contrast? You have black and white contrast, like a checkerboard. Opacity and translucency are contrasts. And so are complementary colors. Red next to green, that's a Christmas thing. All your football uniforms for every college team and pro team, they all are like the pants are one color and the, and the jerseys are usually a complementary color, unless you're an Oakland Raider, which is silver and black. But most of it is like blue and orange, you know, violet and yellow. Those are complementary color contrasts and they, they neutralize each other. So if you were to have a yellow stain, I mean, excuse me, a yellow shade, like a B shade, B2, B3, and you put blue on it in the incisal, you know you put blue and you know the shade is yellow, but the viewer is gonna appear greenish in, in some areas because blue and yellow make green. So you have two local colors, yellow and blue, right next to each other, but the optical color that hits your eye is green. And so you have to use a violet when you use yellow, and you can use blue when you use when you have an orange shade like uh, A shades or you know the middle shades in the 3D, the M shades. So you have to learn all those things before you can flow through this glazing process. So this is a photograph showing a pretty darn good exposure. It shows little contrast. However, this photo shows how the teeth really look. And this is, this is a real good indication of this young man's teeth. And of course, they've been dried out, so you see all the whitish. Now let's look at the next slide. So if I deliberately underexpose these, I can see the contrast zones and the decalcified enamel from his mouth drying out is sticking out like a sore thumb. Opacity and translucency demarcation is clearly seen. So what good is this picture to me? What it is, is if I have to make a crown on this guy, I know where to cut the dentine back and I know where to use enamel and clear. And the lighter parts, the white, they stand out more than the other parts, you see? And so this picture allows me to, when I build up the crown, uh, to do a better better buildup. Now, if I go the other way and overexpose, like most doctors, photographs like this, not all of them, but <laughs> I've seen a lot of clinics where everything is washed out and everything matches. So that's a, you know, you can't, can't that's not acceptable. You can't see any transition or anything. So most, pe most, most people say, oh, I like that. That's a smile case. Oh, look how beautiful. But if you're doing all of them, it's one thing. If you're doing one or two, it's not going to work. So you, you can use photography to control, uh, to, excuse me, to help you uh, determine and you control your buildup better. So the same rules apply. Hue, value, and chroma rules apply to stains the same way they apply to shades. Any major change in value will be noticed. The value level of the stains or colors have to be mixed with white or black until the value change is not noticeable. This is a magic. This is just color science and it's very effective. So if you have the value, if the value is not the same in all areas of a tooth, this influences the form. So this phenomenon is seldom noticed or understood, yet it's a major contributor to the lack of natural tooth forming crowns. This was one of my lectures in, at the uh, Ceramic Symposium in 1984. And that is that the influence of color on tooth form. So let's say you have a crown that is uh, very translucent proximally, 
and the rest is normal. If you don't lower the value or you don't design the framework properly, you're going to have the same value in the middle of the crown as in the proximals, and that crown will appear larger, just like the Felix statue that I poured in white plaster instead of glass. So let's, what do I mean by this? So for instance, the value range of the shade guides are ignored in the stain kits, most of them. So 1M2, 2M2, 3M2, 4M2, and 5M2 are orange. Those are five value changes from the lightest orange to the warmest orange. Yet we don't have five different stains with five different values. So you can't come up with a stain to say, oh, okay, it's a 5M2. I can't use that same stain on a 2M2 or a 1M2. That stain would look too gray on a 1M2, and a 1M2 stain would look way too bright on a 5M2. So it's up to you so you can mix a little bit of gray with it and touch it. And when you touch it, you can't see where you put it. That's what you use. So does this matter? This is the same, like I mentioned, this is a dynamic range. So you should be able to see white on the right and black on the left. Uh, in RGB terms, uh, pure white, you know, you can have zero, which is black 256. White, you can't reproduce that in nature or in monitors, it's impossible. But at least it's a good way so that you can see that the same color can exist in all kinds of uh, value changes. And that's how you need to learn to control to be a top, top stainer <laughs> or coloring person for, for the lab. And here I have white and black and I have one same old yellow stain and see the difference? I can mix just a little bit and lower the value or I can mix a little white and raise the value. The two extreme yellows are the same. The, first, the, the one in the middle is mixed with white here to the right and it, the, with black to the left. And that's it. And that way you can get whatever shade you want if you're having a tough time matching a tooth. It may be just a matter of, of changing the value of the stain itself. And of course, with grayscale, the same thing. You have to understand white to black. The more of those that you have, the easier it is to get the tones. So let's go over a little bit of shade terminology. So if you look at the pure value, you have white is 100, 90 is less, 80, 70, 60, if we go by tens. So that's the lightness level. So the whitest for sure is OM1. And like I said before, you can mix OM1 and 1M1 and create this middle color. In the, and this is a beautiful color. 0.5M1 is one of my favorites because it's not a real bleach shade. And a lot of patients accept that color because they say, well, I don't want that real, you know, what do they call it, toilet bowl white or some, something. And so remember, if you, have, if you don't have any room at all, you have a choice of using dentin or base dentin. And if you don't have any room, base dentin is a little bit more opaque or less translucent than the dentin. The next thing you have to be careful is, if you fire the heck out of anything, you melt it and it becomes more translucent. So you can sometimes just change your firing temperature a little bit to where you're still fusing the material, but you're not melting it and producing so much glass that it'll become super translucent. So you can knock down a few degrees and it might help you in blocking out whatever you're trying to. Hughes refer to colors, the names that you usually call things. So you have red, yellow, green, orange, whatever, till you go around the circle. And the whole idea is, is you can mix any of these together and create any color you want. The difference is, is what are you gonna mix it with? So if you were to use this pure, beautiful red color and mix it with white, you get pink. If you mix it with something that's not so white, like white with gray, a quote unquote, lower value white, you're gonna get a lower value pink. And this is what I want you guys to understand. And again, you can mix just, just the dentines in your kit too. So if you have a, a, a 2M2, but you say, you know what, I need a little, it's, a little, it's awfully thin here. 
and I know it's going to look bright, but just use a little 3M2 at the neck wherever it's thin. And by the time you thin it out, it's going to look like a 2M2. So you have to use your reasoning. It's, it's easier to do it on a 3D guide because it's mathematically predictable, whereas the classic is more intuition. And chroma is the intensity of a color, let's just say. So this, this is still like a pinkish, but this is more saturated. And that would be like from an A1 to an A4, 5M3 instead of 5M1, et cetera, et cetera. So what you have to remember, 1M2, 2M2, 3M2, 4M2, and 5M2 are basically the same shade. They just have has a lower value. The 5M2 has a lower value. So if you go to the right, the value lowers. If you go to the left, the value heightens. I think that's a word. But anyway, that's uh, in a nutshell, you have to learn some of these basic uh, science of color and it'll help improve your predictability. That's what we're after. I always try to teach improving your predictability. You got, you have, Geller calls it a sixth sense. If you use this stuff enough, and if you fire enough tabs, you have an idea of what the thing's gonna look like when you look in the mouth and say, I gotta match this thing or whatever. If you're trying to hit a shade guide, that's one thing. If you're trying to match a natural tooth, that's something else altogether. So again, you can download the scale if you want to calibrate your monitor. You can see it says Sonera Technology Display Mate. And just go to their website and download it. It's no big deal. And then when you when you can see all these colors, you can see from the far right at the top of white on this uh, Apple monitor that I have in this little uh, MacBook that's 12 years, let's see, 11 years old already, and it's still kicking, thank God. You can see the difference in steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Looks like 20 steps. And so when I when you can see those, you can say, wow, that's pretty darn good. If it's too bright, your monitor, you won't see the last two or three whites on the right, it'll look the same. And if there's too low, you, you won't see the last two or three on your left, which is the black. So once you do that, if a doctor sending you digital pictures over the internet, there's a lot to worry about there because you have a certain camera that he uses. You can have a JPEG uh, that they send you. If your monitor doesn't produce the same color space as the camera, you need to be using RGB, sRGB, which is a small RGB. That's the best. And if you want a really good monitor, you can get what's called an IPS monitor. I have one from, uh, oh, what the heck is that guy's name? I can't even remember now. But uh, what it is, it's called interplanar switching. And what it does is it has the best color accuracy. Of, it's a Dell. Uh, IPS monitors are the best. If you don't know what those are, look it up. And you can see that's the best for color reproduction. And you can get one now for about four or $500, which is huge because the, the top of the line ones uh, are 15 grand and things like that. So that is a huge improvement with a very, very low price. So to see true color, you need a color corrected light. And there's a few of those you have uh the smile light i think it's called from uh from chris brad chris bradley at smile line you can use anything from like a d65 or d55 which are color temperatures which are which allow you to see quite a few perfect tones you can't use a you know yellowish lights or orange lights that just doesn't work anymore it never did so these are the, this is the one that I use. It has a little magnet that you can actually put a polarizer in it and it knocks the sheen of the tooth and you can see the internal structures of the teeth and they're, they're not expensive and they're really useful. They have their own battery. And so when I take a shade, I prefer to use a color corrected light like this 
and my linear shade guide. I'm gonna tell you why I switched from the 3D master to the linear, because it's the same thing. It's just one of them is bigger than the other. I don't like the box that that thing comes in. I'm going to do a Rubik's cube better than putting those those little cards back where they belong. I mean, it's I don't like it, but I have it. I have it in something that's the little steps. I just put them in there. But I was taking a shade on a gentleman about a three years ago, and I fanned out the the three M one, three M two, three M three, but I didn't do it the right way. And when I went to take a shade, the two M3 went right up the guy's nose. <laughs> and I said, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and from then on, I said, I'm not, I'm not using this anymore. So I got the old 3D out and started using it there. And by the way, if you have a three uh, linear guide, order five tabs, uh, one M1, excuse me, zero M1, 1M1, 2M1, 3M1, 4M1, and 5M1, and take those in that gray card out, which are 1M2, 2M2, 3M2, take those out and put those in there, and it'll be a lot easier for you to take the shade where you can determine the value first. It's two steps. Pick, pick the value, go to the card, let's say two, and then pick your shade, and that's it. Two steps. And uh, you won't shove it up anybody's nose either. Anyway, I hope you learned something about viewing color, and uh, I hope to speak to you guys again pretty soon. And things that you can't change, no matter what, are color phenomena beyond our control, and that is the opal effect that some teeth have that make them appear bluish. And of course, over bleach shades will turn this way because something's happening in there. So whenever someone talks about bleach shades, you have to be very careful because when they keep bleaching, they end up being a bluish violet color. And, and that, you make a crown and the teeth will keep changing because they keep bleaching and you will never get that match right. It's almost like a D1 shade with a clear blue opal enamel on top. I haven't figured it out yet because they all, they keep changing. Anyway, I really thank you for taking your time. And if you want to get a hold of me, uh, Jim will have the phone. Just text me first and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. Can you talk to me and, I'm, and tell me who you are? And I will do that. If you call and I don't know your number, my phone will block it. I have more followers. If I have Instagram, I have more followers than Kim Kardashian. So that's why I don't have uh, Instagram. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, Jim. Questions. Uh, so uh, do you glaze zirconia crowns once or twice? Um, some people like to glaze twice, some only once, but some people have a lot, a hard time uh, glazing zirconia to begin with. Um, but yeah. how do you treat zirconia? Well, you know, zirconia, the, the melting temperature is what what are we centered at i mean it's ridiculous it's what is it like 1500 celsius or more so no matter what that structure is it's never going to glaze by itself so it has to have a medium you have to use some type of glaze now if your glaze is too thin uh that can cause it to look not as glazed if you put on a, a decent amount of glaze but it still doesn't look shiny that just means it's not gone up high enough because that zirconia really takes forever to heat up. And as you know, it takes forever to cool down. So uh, you need to take up the best way to do this is to take a like a small, a few crowns that you've done that maybe screwed up or didn't work and then a ponic or two, a bridge, and then mix your glaze up and run that sucker up in your furnace uh until when you see the 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 start at around 400 and leave it there i inch it up in my in my furnace not too close but let it heat up enough and now for these bigger cases i have like a 20 to 30 minute dry out at 400 and then uh, all that turns white and then i go about 
I would say eight minutes in the furnace from low to high, and the high could be zirconia by itself without a veneer. You could take it to 850 and get a beautiful glaze and then bring it down to where it's at least 400 and let it sit there for a good, a good while. You don't want to strain that zirconia, especially the big cases. You got to go slow, but that's that's now as far as characterizing the zirconia. If it's just straight zirconia on interior cases, I have to be honest with you. They, the doctors that I work with, they don't they don't want straight zirconia unless it's a full arch, uh, upper and lower, where we go ahead and do that. And sometimes if it's just a layered, what do you call it? Uh, a three layer zirconia or multi layer and all that and everything looks the same we can we can polish as well but as far as the glazing it itself the minimum temperature i go to is 850 and i mix the stains where they're creamy i mean the glaze lt glaze where they're creamy and i paint it on and that's it let it dry till it's white and then run it up now a lot of times if I have to characterize, I'll always characterize first with the stains of blues and whatever I want to put on it and fire those and set them real nice. And then I go back and cover that with glaze. Like I said before, the only thing I don't glaze are like single molars. Uh, excuse me, the occlusal table is always polished on anything. There was a study done by Glidewell and, and Dr. Christensen. You can still see it at the at the Glidewell uh, website where they did the where and also what's whatever Gordon's I can't remember Clinical Research Associates. They published it in that and it showed some of the glazes can wear wear away quite quickly. The same on what they tested Emax or zirconia, and then the most important thing with zirconia is that the occlusal table anything that's occluding perhaps a ramps on a canine, on a disclusion that those things have to be super smooth and polished. If not, they'll eat the teeth up. Uh, but if you glaze it, the glaze starts to break down and it can also abrade the enamel. So that's why we cut, we cut a microscopic little tiny finish line on the facial of these zirconia crowns. I use the little, the round diamond, I mean the uh, cylinder diamond and I just, barely taken down on the green stage. And then when I glaze, I have a stop line or a finish line right below the occlusal, like the cusp tip area or whatever. And then the rest of the crown is polished. So the all around is glazed. And if it's an abutment that's made out of zirconia, like the ASC abutment, we don't have any glaze whatsoever on the clinical, on the uh, tissue side of the crown. So from the implant head up just past the tissue, it's polished. We don't like glaze underneath the tissue. The uh, bacteria loves glaze. It hates zirconia because there's nowhere to nowhere to grab a hold of. So uh, one of the follow-up we do it. One of the follow-up questions, uh, and you uh, kind of touched on it, was uh, the ramp up the heat rate per minute when you have a larger piece of uh, zirconia, what yeah. do you uh, put your uh, degree per minute at? We go, I, I go between 20 and 30 degrees a minute. That's what uh, Zircon recommends. Uh, Enrico Steger, I mean, a lot of the other people that were some of the zirconia guys are always going, you know, depending on what glaze you're using etc you could actually get a good glaze with the lt glaze as low as 780 800 no problem just have to take your time to go there from 400 to 800 that's 40 degrees i mean 400 degrees difference and divide by 20 degrees a minute that's going to take you what 20 minutes so you can do the math on those, but if it's a huge case and you're bringing it up, <clears throat> I'll never forget Paul Cascon from Argent did a lecture, and he said that he did not that he didn't think zirconia liked 900 degrees Celsius for some reason or other. He says 
Zirconia 900 don't get along. I don't know why, but he said to always go above 900 and leave it there or a little below, depending on your glaze. He just didn't like that 900. I don't know why, but just in his lectures, you can see it. Right. But yeah, it's a, you, need, you need the bigger the case, the slower you do it. It's just giving the zirconia time to warm up and accept the glaze. If you go too fast, if the if the glaze is low fusing, it'll it'll melt and ball up on itself more. Uh, have you tried any of the newer hybrid uh, brushes that are half uh, like half Kalinsky, half? Yeah, I did, uh, and I I don't artificial. like uh, I don't like them. Uh, that uh, I have both the Nera or New Era or whatever. And the black one, which is another one, I can't, I don't know what it is, but I, I got them both. And uh, they load up with porcelain too much. Dr. McLaren likes the black one, which I can't remember the name off the top of my head now, but I still like the Kalinsky Sable. There's a brush, there's a brush. Uh, I mean, you can get Windsor and Newton Series 7 uh, artist brush, like a number six or Raphael brush from France. Those are really good brushes. Those are artist brushes. And those were how I learned was with a Rowney brush, George Rowney and company. They sold part of that. It's affiliated with another one. And they have what's called a Diana series brush. It has nothing to do with the princess. But we, Hubbard uh, taught us how to use uh, Rowney number six and that was a good stiff brush that you see the trick is a lot of the watercolor brushes are are too uh, soft and then you know you you load it up with the with the pigment the paint the watercolor paint and you know it can last quite a few strokes the difference when we do porcelain is that you need something that's fairly stiff with a tip so you can pick it up easily and of course those synthetic brushes answer that need but on occasion, you build up a few. If you flatten it out to try to shape your crown, it loads up with porcelain. It doesn't have the oil that the sables have. And that's what keeps repelling the water, the liquid mixture with the porcelain. So I, I still like my Kalinsky brushes. All right. So, um... Question is uh, on your one picture that you showed your uh, stain palette, that white stain palette that looked like a yeah. uh, football stadium. Uh, yeah. Where did where did you get that? We use one that's smaller now. It's by Magello, M I J E L L O. If you go to Amazon and just type that in, Magello palettes, get the little one. They're like fifteen bucks. That one's too big, and it's awkward. But the little ones, uh, they're, the wells are about half the size. I got a couple of them. I've got like two or three. They have some that are like a red, uh, reddish, uh, you know, top. Another one's blue, whatever. I just didn't put it in there. I don't know why. It was in the last lecture. But that's the original one that I had mixed all my, every bottle in that stain kit is in there. That's an expensive palette. I still have it, and uh, and you see that those have an O-ring in it, and, and you can mix the colors right in the middle. Whenever you start to use those little circles, little holes like that, you can't do anything with those things. That's just, that's, you just can't work that way. You need space. You need room to mix stuff and all that, but some people like the little tiny, I just can't do it. I'm a big boy. Uh, I need a bigger power. <laughs> You need the working space. I understand. That's right. Uh, have you ever shifted a 4M1 zirconia to a, a 5M1 or 5M2? And it's if so, hard. how always, did you do it? I always do a cut back and I layer. Okay. Because it's really difficult. The problem is when you look at the at the refractive index of zirconia and how white it is, it's very hard to use pigments to create a 5M1 from a zirconia, unless you're gonna use colorant, uh, like for instance, the liquids, the coloring liquids, 
and you just get a white zirconia and then you can paint them. The big problem is, is any of those things, doesn't matter what it is, when you fire zirconia over and over again, over 900, uh, the, the, the color burns out. So with all good intentions, you can color these things, but use a high fusing porcelain and it'll it'll wipe out the color. So when you fire it over and over again, you reduce the chroma. And that's how it works. So the, the whole thing is, is if you really want to match a shade and you have a framework that's fairly dark, you can paint it with the colors. Uh, you use a low fusing porcelain and it won't burn out the oxides. That's why you go on, that's why you go to low fusing porcelain. Because the oxides that they use to color the zirconia and all these darker shades, they burn out. I did that. I said, wait a minute here. I, I did a big arch and a, the occlusal tables were in porce were in zirconia and the veneers, the facial veneer was a, a regular shade. So I picked a 3M2. I built this case up and every time I fired it, it was getting lighter. And I'm like, wait a minute, something's not right here. And then I called Bob Kelly and he had never seen that. So I sent him a couple of frameworks and then he says, hmm, this is getting lighter. So at a certain temperature, the oxides that they use burn away and your framework gets lighter. That's why sometimes you see a high, higher value restoration because you're losing some of the chroma in the framework from too high a firing temperature. So, All right, and, that, and then you have, you do a lot of clinical work as well. Um, yes. Everyone understands that. So um, when you have an existing patient, I'm trying to paraphrase this, but when you have, a, when you have an existing patient comes in with a crown and whatever reason it's come off, and you have the doctor ask you to reglaze, re-stain uh, it. Uh, how, what's your process to dry that out so it doesn't blow up in your furnace? I do that all the time. And uh, in fact, I, I have, I mean, we do, I don't care what it is. We have uh, screw retained zirconia bridges. And what I do is I set them, first thing you do is you have to wash it really well. And then I, I uh, sandblast everything. I aerobrate it, uh, very low pressure. If they're cemented or not, we use ASC abutments, which are screwed down, so I don't have to deal with cement very much. But if I do, I take the cement out of the crown, uh, and then I put it in the furnace, I stood up like a peg, the same, no difference. And then I have my furnace and my low temperature set at 600. And I leave it about three inches from where the muffle goes up, and I leave it there, and it stinks the whole lab up. <laughs> and then once that is, I inch it up little by little. And when I close it at 600, when it comes down, you're going to see black areas where the bacteria has been, and then the carbon from the dead bacteria and the food or whatever the hell is in, is in there, that will not completely eliminate at 600. And then what, what I do then when it comes out, I have to sit there and wait till it cools down to room temperature. And then I blast all that off very lightly. And then I reglaze everything, run it up and everything's with VM9. I've never had uh, any failure whatsoever. We did right. one not too long ago. You can ask Dr. David Clary in Naples. We did one that had been in the mouth for over three years and nothing happened. <laughs> so it's just, you have to warm it up. If you see some cracks and stuff in it, I have some phenol blue and you put that on there and it first cracks in the porcelain, that blue will run right in there. Like food coloring will do it. Uh, that will blow up because you have moisture in the cracks. So if you don't have if you don't have uh, cracks already in the porcelain, it should be good. But but I always check it. Right. Remember the blue stuff that we used to sell for the Inseram? Yeah, the indicator. It's like, it's like a blue food color or yeah anything like that. You can paint on there, and if you see any cracks where that blue shoots through, 
that means that that portion's cracked already. When you heat it up, it'll just open up. Do you do you, if you know recognize that? Do you uh, break it open just, and? Yeah, I just I just uh, go right up. Depends on what I have to do. I, sometimes if I blast off everything on the surface, I smooth it down and you know refinish it. I've been very lucky, I guess, but I haven't. I'm. I mean, I'm telling. Call the doc. Put it in a book. That's yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, Felix, I appreciate all your time, and and I want to thank everybody for their time visiting us and and joining us on this webinar and and listen to today's uh, topic. Uh, it's very interesting and a lot of information there. Uh, any, any last words you'd like to say to the uh, the group that's uh, participating? Well, I'll tell you, if uh, the most important thing is to learn your materials and fire tabs uh, so that you know what you're dealing with. You got to fire those tabs, like the tissue porcelain tabs, mix it with clear, whatever. And it depends on what your target is. You have to know your target before you can go anywhere. Like the old, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. <laughs> and so you have to know your target. You have to know what it what that is. And sometimes these targets are moving targets. Uh, we don't get uh, a chance to see the patient or really know what they need. I mean, I'm lucky that way, but it's also a curse sometimes because they don't know what they want. And you could do a crown that's so nice, and all of a sudden they'll say, "Well, it's, it looks like a little." I don't know what that is. I mean, I do a white, a one and one and I put a little tiny, perfect little blue halo on a corner. And she said, what is that? I said, that's a halo. That's what your natural tooth has over here. She goes, well, I don't want that. Can you take that out? <laughs> so you have to listen to them and just, you know, it's better not to do any of that internally and then just go ahead and if they, if they say, if they don't say anything, and you put it on the outside, just rubber wheel it off. <laughs> but yeah. it's really difficult when you don't know where you're going. Yep. So anyway, that is so true. You and, uh, again, call me whenever. Just text me. Let me know who you are. So, okay. Oh. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Remember, uh, a recording of this will be posted on our Vita North America YouTube channel in a few days. Felix, have yourself a great uh, evening and weekend. Thank and thank you, everyone, again for joining us. This concludes you, today's webinar with Felix Pages. Thank you, Jimbo.